All right, folks, uh, welcome back to Swift on Sundays. Uh, as always, my name is Paul Hudson, and I've got lots of things to show you today. We're building a full app from scratch. Um, I've been asked ahead of time to give you the assets for the project, so I've tried to do that. If you are watching this stream later on, the link I'm about to paste in the chat window will not work. Uh, so don't try to use this link. Go to the GitHub repo where I have all the Swift on Sundays projects there. You can get this thing from there later on. Folks, in the live stream, I'm going to paste to you into the chat window the URL to use so you can get access to the assets for today's project, all being well. Uh, and it will give you the pictures required to follow along so you can grab those things uh, and hopefully code with me. So I'll paste that in. Again, as a reminder to folks, this will not work after the fact. It's only for the live streamers, this zip file. Everyone else wants to go to the GitHub repo and get them there, otherwise be very confused indeed. So go ahead and grab uh, those assets. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. While that's happening, I just want to remind you of the rules. Uh, I have a zero harassment policy. Uh, so uh, if you uh, are abusive or unpleasant or unwelcome or whatever, wasting my time or other folks' time, it's an instant ban on the channel. I have literally zero patience for that. So go ahead and grab the files. Okay, now our goal, if you remember these things, is to try and build something real in about an hour. Uh, and uh, last time I asked folks, uh, you know, listen, I've done six full streams now, that's six weeks of, uh, of apps. Uh, who would like to see a Sprite Kit game being made? And it turns out Sprite Kit was very popular. Um, folks, uh, so I think three quarters of folks voted for a Sprite Kit game. Uh, so that's what we're going to try and do today. Uh, now, as this is the first game in seven whole streams, I thought I'd try and make sure we use a good variety of Sprite Kit's power. Um, so we'll be using physics, we're using particle effects, we'll be using accelerometer, we'll be using uh, some fragment shading just for fun. Um, however, there is something I have to get clear to you up front, which is that uh, you may know if you've done any Sprite Kit games before that the iPad simulator is really slow. Uh, like really, really slow, uh, unmanageably slow, in fact. Um, so uh, it means that to, to, to really test this game out, I can't use simulator. So just for extra uh, lols, another bit of complexity, um, I'll be doing live coding in Xcode uh, while using the iPad device, a real one, next to me, uh, connected to my Mac, and hopefully sharing the iPad screen on my screen. Um, so you have to see me and my code and the iPad while I'm trying to make the game. That's in theory, uh, I say, because as you may or may not know, that little connection between QuickTime and uh, the Mac can go either way. It might work, it might break hideously, in which case we're kind of stuck with the simulator and all the slowness with it. Uh, I should say, don't worry, I did test this out on my iPad, I've got an iPad Pro and a four-year-old iPad and both were blazingly fast. You know, none of the things we're doing today will even fractionally challenge Sprite Kit. It's a very, very fast API. Okay, with that, uh, I said enough chat for now. I'm gonna go ahead and try and share my screen. Uh, da -da -da. And hopefully, hopefully, you're going to see uh, my screen, me in the corner, uh, and my iPad behind it, and the chat area. There's all sorts of things going on at the same time in this window. Um, so if you can see the iPad, that's a good sign. It means things are actually working, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, again, our goal is to whiz through a real Sprite Kit project uh, as fast as we can. An, an hour or so is usually my goal. If you do have questions about the thing I'm currently doing on the screen, please dive in, ask in the chat, I'll address it straight away. If you have general questions, the usual one is opinion on Flutter or whatever nonsense like that, Keep those to the end, please, otherwise it's massively distracting. It really does hurt my head. Uh, so I am going to uh, go ahead and launch Xcode, uh, not the beta version, the, the current version, uh, and then choose from here, create a new Xcode project, and choose iOS game from the list, uh, which gives us a Sprite Kit template. Now, personally, I absolutely despise the Sprite Kit template. It's really, really bad. It's it's like sample code rather than a template, uh, which isn't that helpful. It isn't helpful at all. Uh, I'll call this thing. Our game's called uh, OMG Marbles. 
Uh, how do you put the iPad on the screen? Uh, using QuickTime, you can press new movie recording and show your iPad in there. And in, in theory, you're supposed to kind of hit record down here to select this thing. Uh, but if you don't, it just kind of shares the screen, which is very helpful. I can kind of select it and swipe around a little bit and it all kind of works nicely, which is great. Anyway, uh, I'll go ahead and choose uh, my uh, iPad game, choose the name, which is OMG Marbles, uh, then press create. It'll have a little think. There we go. And it will it'll create the uh, usual sort of junk sprite kit template. And it really is bad. Uh, you've got to go into gamescene.sks and there's a huge hello world label, which you never want. Delete. Uh, uh, personally, while I'm here, I very much prefer for this kind of game to change the anchor point for my uh, scene. It's 0 0.5, 0 0.5 by default. So I've centered it horizontally and vertically. Um, I much prefer using 0, 0 for this kind of game, as you'll see, only because it makes positioning things much easier. It means positioning from the bottom left corner for 0, 0, which is much easier. Uh, we have this thing, Actions SKS, full of like fade out and scale and so forth. Just delete that. It's just junk. We don't need any of that junk. Goodbye. Uh, and in GameScene.Swift, you'll see Label and Spinny Node and all this utter junk. Just get rid of this code. I don't even know what it's doing in there. It's all going to go away. Uh, I'm going to leave the sort of remnants of did move to. Get rid of all touch down, all touch moves, all touch up, all touches began. Uh, these all die by my hand today. Just move it to end it, touches canceled, blah, 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 all die. Hurrah. And finally, uh, input uh, gameplay kit. Uh, Chris, I, th I think it's bottom left in Sprite Kit. I think it's inverted in Sprite Kit, um, just because, you know, lol. <laughs> anyway, uh, that has cleaned up our game template to be significantly more uh, usable, more clean, and better to build on. I wish that were the template, um, but it isn't, sadly. That is some sample code we get instead, which is delete it all. <sighs> anyway, in this game, we're going to display a grid of marbles to choose from. Uh, and they come in a variety of colors. If you look in the assets folder you downloaded, hopefully from uh, the site or from GitHub, if you're following on later on, uh, you'll see stacks of these uh, ball images. Uh, we've got uh, blue, blue, cyan, green, gray, purple, red, yellow, checkerboard, and OMG. Uh, I want you to drag all those into our asset catalog. So we have some graphics to work with. Uh, so I'm gonna just grab all these into the asset catalog. Boom. Uh, they're all retina, which is fantastic. So they work out the box. Uh, and I'm going to list these uh, ball names, blue, cyan, green, gray, purple, and red, and yellow, in an array inside our game scene. So we know uh, the possible balls we can load into our little balls on the grid. And we'll sort of randomize that when the game starts. Uh, so we're going to say inside, oops, inside game scene, not that I've made that storyboard, thank you very much. Game scene, we're going to say, var balls equals an array of, I'm going to hide this pane here, make it big as I can, an array of uh, ball blue, then ball, oops, <laughs> m dot, uh, ball green, then ball purple, then ball red, a comma there obviously, ball red, then ball yellow. Uh, RRL asks, I looked on iPhone, you can, you probably can, just make the balls much smaller, um, but I use an iPad because it lets us have nice big chunky balls, which makes the game much more fun, quite frankly. Uh, I suspect it would work on an iPhone, but be harder to sort of tap, less fun perhaps. Anyway, those are our balls, blue, green, purple, red, and yellow. And each of those things are going to be a sprite kit node in our game. So we'll have, you know, one ball here, one ball here, one ball here, duh, 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 rows and columns of balls across the way. Uh, now, when I use this kind of thing, when I have lots of nodes on a screen of a particular type, I have a, a, a very, very lazy shortcut uh, where I um, uh, make them a custom class of SK sprite node. This is not required. You don't have to do this. I just find it significantly easier to do for me. I have something like this. Uh, class ball inherits from SK sprite node open and close braces, like that. I mean, it, it does nothing at all to add to it, but it's now a custom class. So I can say, hey, this thing, this node here, are you a ball, trivially, rather than do like, you know, have you got the prefix ball in your name or something like that. It's a nice, cheaty way to do these things uh, very quickly and easily. So, 
Uh, that is the possible balls we can have. I think, are you trying to show this uh, link? Is that the link here? I'm guessing that YouTube link, probably. Yes, it is. Good. Thank you very much, Robert and Brent. Uh, Magnus, sorry. Um, we've got a custom ball class and uh, a balls array. Uh, and our, our next job is to really make a, a grid full of things. But to do that, we've got to prepare our game screen. Because uh, the default template does two things that kind of break the way this game works. Uh, because we want to fill the screen with balls, which is not too hard to do. But we're also going to use the accelerometer so we can tilt the iPad to control the balls. Uh, and that really screws up when you have screen rotation turned on. You can kind of tilt it a little bit and the screen rotates and that's confused and it looks really weird. Um, so we've got to try and make two small changes to the template to make that whole thing work more smoothly. Uh, one of which is in game view control Swift. You will see we have uh, the scene scale mode set to aspect fill. Uh, and if you look, there are actually a few different options for this. Aspect fill is one of them. And that's a default, which means it will adjust the scene to match the view, uh, which isn't ideal because it'll, it'll be con a confused size. What we want to do is do uh, a resize fill. Uh, and so what will happen is it'll change the size of the scene directly to match the available space. So rather than saying, oh, the scene must be this big and make it fit in that space, no, screw the size of the scene as it says in the um, SKS file, just resize its dimensions to fit the size of the available space. So change it to resize fill there makes our life much, much easier, particularly an iPad where there's lots of different sizes and resolutions and so forth. But Van, good question, leave it to the end, please, otherwise it's awfully distracting. Uh, same Manaharas, leave them to the end, otherwise it's very, very hard to follow along. Uh, so that's going to say, just make our game scene fit the available space. We can get rid of this backwards comment now. The second thing is the rotation device. Um, so in OMG Marbles, uh, you'll see it's set to be a universal thing with portrait, landscape, whatever. Uh, we don't want any of that stuff. We want iPad only. And then I'm going to uncheck portrait, upside down, and landscape left. So it only stays in one orientation the entire time. So you can see exactly where the ball is going to be, and you tilt the thing, it'll be, uh, it'll, it won't rotate the screen. Uh, question from Andrea, could I tell you what's going to be? No, I'd be a surprise. Be a surprise. You'll see it come together. Come on, where's your sense of adventure? Anyway, with those two done, we can go ahead and make a grid of balls on the screen. Uh, and that's not terribly hard. You've got the assets to do that already. The next thing to do is in gamescene.swift, did move to view. When you've shown the screen, what do you want to do? Um, the first thing I'm going to do is add this checkerboard image, this nice big one here. Uh, this is a huge, big, square checkerboard. We're going to place that behind everything on our game. So we'll say, uh, let background equals. But, uh, Pankaj, I understand you, you really want to see the final result. You're going to see it real soon now. Just chill out, relax, enjoy the show. It'll all come together. It's like a surprise twist ending. And don't worry, there are multiple milestones along the way where you'll see exactly uh, how it looks. On, as, as you can see, things happening along the way. We'll add a background first. We've got an SK sprite node. This is an image named checkerboard. That big checkerboard image. Then we'll say uh, our position is equal to the CG point. X will be our frame dot mid X and Y will be our frame dot mid Y. Remember we changed the anchor point for our scene to be zero, zero, bottom left corner. So we've got to move this background to be in the center of our thing so it fills the full screen. And then I'm going to tone down it just a little bit. This thing's a full on checkerboard. It's quite bright. Having an alpha around 0.2 makes it quite gentle against the background. I'm also going to say background dot Z position or Z position is minus one. Put this behind other stuff so it doesn't go in front of our balls. And then add child background. That's the background. That's easy enough to do. The next thing to do, of course, is to add our grid of balls spaced out uh, by columns and rows on the screen. We want to get this done so it positions itself neatly by the size of the ball. So what we're going to do is we'll make a temporary uh, constant called ball. It's an SK sprite node using image named ball blue. Load the blue image. And then we'll say uh, let ball radius equals ball.frame.width divided by 2.0. So that's the radius of one ball. Uh, question from Kevin. Could I explain the difference between did move and scene did load? 
realistically seem to loads the one to use. However, from like iOS 7 to iOS maybe 10, maybe like late nines, scene did load was called more than once, which was very, very annoying. The doctor saying, oh yeah, it only called once and it was called twice. You're like, no, I'm throwing away so much work here. You're calling this damn thing twice. It's very, very annoying. Anyway, that is the size of a ball and its radius. And the radius will matter shortly, so we'll use that for physics as we go. But it'll also matter so we can space things out on the screen neatly. So we want to move across the screen by I and J, by rows and columns, uh, using the size of the ball, but keeping it within the spec of the, the, the size of the screen. Now, the, our screen has a zero, zero anchor point, which is bottom left corner, but all other things have a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 anchor point. So their center is the middle of the sprite. So, uh, we'll do for I in stride from ball radius, which will be the left edge for the ball because it measures from the center. Move it along by half the size of the ball. Two, view dot bounds dot width minus ball radius. Don't go right to the very edge. Give enough space so we aren't pushing the ball back a little bit. By ball dot frame dot width. So we'll move along. We'll start a bit to the left. Move along. Move along. Move along. Move along. Move along. Move along. And end a bit to the right. Question from Zavi, would it be quite easy to initialize the ball with a custom ball class? It doesn't matter. This is a temporary ball just so we can get the sizing nicely. Um, it doesn't actually matter. It's just here for spacing purposes. So move from the near the left edge to near the right edge by ball width amount each time. That's what we're doing here. We'll then say for J in stride from 100, so move up 100 from the bottom to view.bounds.height minus ball radius. So near to the top, leaving enough space for half a ball to sit there by ball.frame.height, which would be the same as the width in this case, but you know what I mean. So move across the whole grid, two-dimensional array. We're going to say, let ball type type equals balls.randomElement force unwrap. Give me a random item from the balls um, array. Could be ball bl blue, could be ball red, could be green, yellow, purple, whatever. I'm happy doing a force unwrap here because the array can't be empty. It's always got items in it. So we'll say, give me a random item. Then we'll say, let ball equals a new ball using the image named initializer, ball type. So make a new ball from ball blue or ball purple or whatever. We're going to use ball or position to place it into the grid nicely, which will be CG point. X will be I, Y will be J. And finally, we're going to set the name of the ball to be its type. So we can track this is a blue ball, this is a green ball, this is a yellow ball, and so forth. We're storing that in its name directly so the ball knows what type it is at all times. And then we'll call add child that ball. So that's all the code in theory, required to get our game up and running. This is the moment of truth, really, for this uh, QuickTime thing. I'm going to press Command-R to build and run, and in theory, it's going to push that to my iPad over here, and we should see a grid of stuff when it finishes building. Come on, you can do it. There's a warning here. I should probably check the full screen box. We'll do that momentarily running on jobs you can do it big white screen yes a grid full of balls that is looking pretty good actually um, i am uh, pleased with that good job okay so we now have a a grid full of balls which is fantastic uh, i'm going to fix this warning because it's complaining uh it's, it needs to be in full screen mode which is fine just check this requires full screen box Whew. so it's complaining that our uh our thing wasn't in full screen. I'll just check that box and make that go away, which is fine. Uh, question from Bogdan Andre. Do I set the Z position for the balls? No, you don't need to um, because uh, it's automatically zero uh, and it's minus one for the background. So it'll be ahead of the, the background. That's all we really care about. Uh, question from Viranchi. Is ball type random element dead out dispatch? I shouldn't think so. It should be a static dispatch. Anyway. So there's space at the bottom, if you notice, there's space at the bottom here, if I launch that again, 
Um, down at the very, very bottom, if I show the screen here, you can see down here is a bit of space for our score. Let's get off it to game, lots of sort of score going on here. Um, otherwise, it, it all sit in there quite nicely. So that looks great. I'll put that to one side. Uh, now, obviously, a big grid of uh, balls is fine. Uh, Georgie, possibly. Possibly. I'm not sure. I haven't tried that. Um, so, a grid, big grid of balls isn't terribly interesting. Um, we can fix it up. We'll say instead, uh, let's apply some physics to our balls. Uh, I'm going to say ball dot physics body physics body uh, is equal to an sk physics body using circle of radius our ball radius so half the width of the ball uh, then these are marbles they've got this sort of shine effect on them i'm going to say uh, ball dot physics body question mark dot allows rotation equals false so the shine doesn't move from one edge that looks wrong for shine shine's always rather fixed on the thing if seeing bid rate, big red X is an X code, it means you have not added the asset to your asset catalog. Uh, so please check that. Uh, we can also say uh, ball dot physics body dot uh, friction equals zero. Make them frictionless. So they slide around more like marbles. Uh, and we can even say uh, ball dot physics body dot restitution equals zero. So they're, they're quite hard. That means not very bouncy. They're still slightly bouncy, as you'll see, but you get the idea. That means as unbouncy as possible. So I'll press Command R again, select this thing, and hopefully we'll see a bit of a change in the way these balls act. Let's find out. Great. There go all the balls. <laughs> what a great game. Making games is so much fun. Uh, okay, so all our balls have just slid off the screen. Hopefully you can see in the background now the sort of checkerboard effect we have going on. Because my, my lovely checkerboard drawing skills. Um, so that is uh, an improvement because we have physics now. But obviously it's not a great game because the balls have all disappeared. And we rather need those things. Um, so really what we want to do is below this loop, give the balls a container to sit inside. So they don't bounce off and roll away and then end the game. Uh, so I'm going to say the physics body for our main uh, scene is going to be an SK physics body using the edge loop from. Now this takes a uh, CG path or a CG rect. And it's really, really helpful. You can basically give it a whole rect around the space uh, and it will just cut that out and say that's the, an edge loop where you can't escape that with the balls. The balls will stay inside a certain area. Now we can't just use our frame like you normally would. Because that bottom part where the balls aren't, that's where the score is going to be. And the score becomes awfully hard to read with multicolored balls behind it. So we want to get rid of that by moving the frame up a little bit. So we're going to do frame dot inset by UI edge insets. I'm going to say UI edge insets. Uh, top will be 100. Remember that's actually the bottom, hopefully. Uh, left will be 0. Bottom will be 0. Right will be 0. And hopefully that'll build, thinking about it, and then run it again. And this time, all being well, the balls will drop down and not escape. Beautiful. I can see them rolling around a little bit, hopefully in the stream. Uh, that's because I've given them really, really low friction. Uh, so they slide around, uh, almost like they're liquid. Uh, like, because they're made of, you know, in theory, glass marbles. Um, so having a, a really slippy marble looks quite nice. Anyway. That's coming along nicely, um, but obviously I've got a real iPad here, and I can't see it, it's just out of shot, I guess. Uh, a real iPad here. Uh, I really want this thing to uh, to tilt, tilt when, I, when I move the screen, I want the balls to respond so it feels more like I'm actually controlling the balls with my iPad. And that's really easy to do on iOS, thanks to core motion. Um, if I uh, go up here and do import core motion, we can use that to track the tilt of the device. So I'll make a new property, uh, var motion manager is a CM motion manager. Boom. Then down at the end of view did low, that's where I did move to view, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna say motion manager is a new CM motion manager. Motion manager question mark dot start accelerometer updates. 
Start telling me when the Seraph has been moved so I can read it more freely. Uh, Smongo, because uh, uh, the sprite kit measures the wrong way around. Sprite kit measures the uh, app kit way, which is bottom left corner rather than top left corner being zero, zero. So it's all sort of flipped, which is not very helpful, I agree, but pff, it is what it is. Anyway, that tells Core Motion to start telling us when, uh, telling us uh, about tilt updates. So now an update, as method here, we can start to read that. We can say, hey, do you have any data for me? And if so, change the gravity of our physics world to respond to that. So I'll say, uh, if let accelerometer data equals motion manager question mark dot accelerometer data, then we could read some tilt data. Then we'll do physics world dot gravity. Where's our gravity coming from? And for this, we use a CG vector, so a direction and a speed in one direction. Um, and uh, this is going to have dx and dy. And we're going to use accelerometer data dot acceleration dot y for that one with some precise values. And I'll try and get it right first time, but I'll probably screw this up. Times minus 50. And for y, I'll say accelerometer data dot acceleration dot x times 50. So what we're doing here is we're reading y for the x and x for the y. Because our uh, iPad is in landscape mode, so it's not, you know, in portrait, x is x and y is y. But it's, it's flipped round 90 degrees. So y becomes x and x becomes y. Now I multiply it by a large number because by default, the, the tilt is really quite uh, broad. You've got to tilt it a long way to get any sort of movement. But multiplying it by a massive amount like 50, it makes the tilting much more sensitive. So you get more control over the balls. And I'm flipping it here, and this is the one I usually screw up because uh, we're in landscape right mode. So it's gonna be the other way around because if you're in, in landscape left mode, it means this way, otherwise it's that way. So you're gonna flip the X, probably. We'll see, I may have screwed it up. I'll run it again and see if that works. You can see if I screwed it up. Uh, here's our game. Oh yeah, look at that. Did not screw it up. Okay, so I can now tilt my iPad to have these balls driving around, doing fun things. And again, they've got super low friction on them. So they slide around really interesting ways. Um, you know, experiment with that, see what you think. I, it's all sorts of fun, quite frankly, playing out little marbles. Anyway, okay, looking good. Let's put that to one side. I could sit and play that all day, sorry. <laughs> it wouldn't make a regular live stream, would it, let's face it. Anyway, uh, so now you can see, no matter what, we have the space at the bottom, or top if you're in UI kit land, um, where there's a big gap for our marbles uh, down down here. And that's where our score is going to go. We want to say down there, the current score is this. Because as they press on marbles, I want to remove that marble. Sorry, I'll get rid of that screen. It's too it's distracting. When they tap, press on the marble, I want to remove the marble they tapped, plus all marbles of the same color around it. And all marbles are the same color around that and around that and around that and around that. They could match potentially 20 or 30 at a time if they're really good at this game, as long as they choose one of the same color. And when they do that, we're going to have uh, uh, a score going up, and the more they match, the higher score they're gonna get. We'll make it much, much bigger to match eight rather than four, or 20 rather than 19 or whatever. So first things first, uh, we've got to uh, add a label on the screen. So we're gonna say, let score label equals an SK label node. We can render the score directly onto the screen. Uh, and we'll use font named, and I'm gonna use Helvetica Neuer Thin. Beautiful, nice modern font. Uh, and that's gonna, we, we we'll render the, the text into there. I'm gonna add that into our scene down here in didmove2. We'll say uh, score label dot font size equals 72, so nice and big. Uh, score label dot position equals the bottom left corner. So I'm gonna say X 20, Y 20. Then score label dot text equals score zero. And score label dot Z position equals 100, above almost everything else at this point. We also have to change the alignment of this thing. We're gonna do horizontal alignment mode equals dot left. And then add child the score label. So put that onto the screen so we can see it nicely. 
Uh, now, of course, having a label by itself isn't enough. We've got to track that with an integer behind it with a score number. So I'll say uh, var score equals zero. But there's a did set observer in there where when we modify the score, we want to format it nicely on the screen. So we'll say uh, let formatter equals a number formatter, uh, formatter dot number style equals dot decimal. So we get like commas between thousands, for example. Then let formatted score equals uh, formatter dot string from score as ns number because of type class required, yay Swift. Otherwise zero if that failed. And then score label dot text equals score formatted score. Mm, score. There we go. Boom. Okay. So hopefully when I press uh, command R now, we should see a score zero at the bottom. It won't change. I haven't written code to actually do matching yet, but we should at least score a score, uh, see a score filling that bottom space. Let's find out. Okay, there we go. Score zero. Sorry, it's sitting here on my lap. That's why it's rolling around a little bit. Anyway, score zero, which is fantastic. That all works nicely. Now for the interesting part. When a tap happens, we want to uh, figure out which ball was tapped so we can remove that ball. But we also want to remove any balls next to it that are the same color and any balls next to that that are the same color, any next to that that are the same color and that color, da -da -da -da. so on so forth. So the whole thing spreads across the screen so you can remove 30, 40 balls if you were obviously very, very good at the game. Um, and to do that, we're gonna write a little method uh, down here that finds all matches for a specific ball. And this is going to be a recursive function. It will call itself. Because if this ball matches this ball, great. We then wanna check from that ball, because it might match one over here. Then check from that ball, then check from that ball, and so forth. We have to keep on matching as long as we go until we've found all possible matches. Uh, now to do that effectively, really we want to make sure we have a uh, a storage area for matched balls. Uh, and the best way of doing that is to use a set. So we can add a ball to the set. So here you are set, store this ball as being one that's been matched. And it allows us to say later on, does our set contain that ball already? If not, ignore it. And this is important because if you imagine we have one here we're trying to match, we match the one to the left of it, or to the right for your reverse case. Uh, we then want to check from that ball. We don't want to rematch this one again, and that one again, and this one again, this one again. Da, 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 da. We don't want that, because um, that would be evil. Um, it would never end, right? We want to say, have we already matched this ball? Yes, ignore it and move on. Question from Virancha. Um, 16 milliseconds regular, eight. Uh, yes, you know, we, we can change that if you want to. We can go to uh, Game View Controller here. Uh, and do uh, view dot preferred frame a second equals to 120. This is an iPad Pro after all. Might as well use that speed as we can. As if I can stream and mirror the screen and get 120 hertz all at the same time, all with Sprite Kit. Let's find out. The answer is yes, 119.9 FPS. Beautiful. Uh, broadly speaking, you don't have to do that. It does look a bit nicer actually. It looks lovely and smooth on the screen. It's so nice. Anyway. Epic tangent, ignore that. Don't do that on your own ones, otherwise you might find it runs awfully slowly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in our game scene uh, a set to track the balls we've matched. So we'll say, uh, below score label, we'll add a new property, var matched balls. Now this is going to be a set of balls. Uh, now remember, sets don't complain duplicates. They're super fast to um, render things nicely. Um, so it, it, they are a great way to do ball matching here. Question from Luke, any way to improve performance on older iPads? It has to be a very old iPad. You know, I tested it on iPad Air 2, which is from 2014, uh, and it was super slick. It was still 60 FPS. Uh, I think using iPad minis, which has always been a bit low spec, so you might struggle there. You have to reduce the ball count. Um, you could simplify the background. Uh, if you use for the background, um, ditch alpha or you know, whatever, do a different background and do something like background.blend mode equals dot replace. That's a faster way of doing rendering for the background, um, but you'll lose some of the nice things about it. You may have to change, if you change the background so it's flat or sort of gray and dark gray rather than having alpha and so forth, and then uh, use a replace blend mode, it would draw faster. 
Yeah, the question has an F2 as well, and it's it's 60 FPS on that. I tested it already. Even with the things we're doing later on, it's still 60 FPS. It's a lovely, fast device, even with Sprite Kit doing all its magic. Anyway, this is a set of balls to match. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, go through and call this function again and again and again and again and again and again and again. To try and find all balls touching the start ball that match, i.e. have the same name. Because remember, the name is equal to its ball type. So ball blue or ball purple or ball yellow and similar. So we can say, hey, I'm ball yellow. Are you ball yellow? Yes. Are you ball yellow? Yes. Are you ball yellow? And so forth. Um, so start with that and you'll get on a long way. So uh, down here, we'll write a method. We'll say func get matches from node a ball. So starting from here, where are all the matches you can get to? Now, helpfully, uh, all physics bodies have a method on them called all contacted bodies. They refer to all things currently touching it on the screen. So we can say for body in node dot physics body. And I'm going to do a force unwrap here because we know this is a ball. It's got a physics body. That's kind of the point of these things. Dot all contacted bodies. Guard let ball equals body dot node as a ball else continue. So as our little typecast there, we can say, make sure this thing actually is a ball and not something else we happen to find in the scene. Um, so this is why having a little class called ball is really helpful. We can then say guard let ball dot name is equal to node dot name. Make sure we're matching the same kind of ball, otherwise continue. So again, our ball name will be ball yellow or ball red or ball green. We don't want to match green balls and yellow balls together. Let's tap the yellow ball. We only match yellow balls around it. So we're going to do a check here to make sure we have a uh, oops, Daisy. equals, not equals, equals. What is equals, equals? What am I doing? Oh, no, it's no let. Sorry. There we go. Duh. Um, so it'll only match the balls around at the same color, which is fantastic. Next, we can say, okay, we've found a contacted body, one that's touching us right now. Uh, it definitely has a node attached to it. It's a ball. It has the same color as us, which is fantastic, but has it already been matched in this sweep? Because if it has, we want to skip it. So we'll say, if not matched balls, dot contains that ball. So if we haven't yet matched this ball, fantastic. Match balls dot insert that ball. And then we'll call get matches from that ball. So it spreads. It'll check from the first ball, it'll match the one above it, It'll check from that one, find another one, check from that one, and so forth. It spreads around the whole screen until it's gone through all possible contacted bodies, which is exactly what you want. So you can match 10 or 20 balls all at once, as long as they were touching at the time. So now we can write a method that checks touches. We're going to say touches ended. So we're going to tap on the screen, what should happen? Uh, first things first, we'll call super touches ended, touches event. First things first, where did they tap? We'll say guard let position equals touches dot first dot location in self, else return. So if we couldn't find where they tap for some bizarre reason, just get out. This is a non tap, ignore it. Next up, we can say guard let tapped ball equals all the nodes at that position but only the first one where it is a ball. Oh, capital B and ball. So again, here's a little, a little cheeky little class we have here. The ball class does nothing, but it gives us a really, really clean way to find the ball that was tapped as opposed to the background or the score label or who knows what. Find me where they tapped the first thing they tapped that was a ball. And if that succeeds, we'll do a typecast as ball. If that fails, get out. So they did not tap a ball. We could not find any ball where they tapped. Next up, we can now say match balls dot remove all. Clear out whatever happened previously. Let's keep the capacity amount as well. So get rid of any ball to match previously. Just get rid of them entirely. We can then say get matches from the tap ball, which will find all things tap touching that ball, all things touching those balls, all things touching those balls and those balls, duh, 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 and let's go through the entire screen of touching things and add them all to our matched balls array. So at this point, matched balls should contain some balls that match their thing. 
But we don't just want players to tap one ball at a time or, or two balls at a time. Because that's too easy. They can just clear away all the ones and end up with like a 300 match at the same time. That's not much fun, right? And more challenging to do is to say if match balls dot count is greater or equal to three. They've got to match groups of three at the absolute minimum. Now we can say uh, for ball in matched balls, ball dot remove from parent. So remove all matches now. Let's try and run that. I'll press Command R. So I can start playing this game a little bit. Screen full of balls. I'll tap this big yellow chunk here. There we go. All going away. So I can now go ahead and start removing balls. And they just fall into place around it, which is fantastic. There's one here. There's some here. So it works pretty well. Uh, I can sort of work my way through, find a nice group of four greens at the bottom there. Uh, some yellow ones here, some more yellow ones. It works pretty well. Uh, it's not perfect though. Uh, now I've made the balls super slippy because it makes it as good as possible with easy matching. Um, because um, if they have a higher friction or default restitution, what you'll find is the horizontal ones have tiny amounts of space between them, you know, invisible amounts to our eye. We look at it and saying, yes, that's touching, but in practice, it isn't quite touching. So a sprite will say, sorry, you can't match that one. So if you've got three together, of which two are touching and one is 0 0.0001 away, the physics engine will say, nope, not touching. You can't have that, you're stuck. Um, but by making them super slippy, that reduces the chance of it happening. Uh, but it still happens now and then. I haven't actually seen one yet. Occasionally you're playing, you'll think, that's not fair, I can, I can tap that. Um, so what we have now is a sort of the fastest way of doing this technique. Uh, we could, if you wanted to, implement a different technique to match things by hand that gives them a little bit of leeway. So if balls look like they're touching, but physics, the system says, no, they aren't quite touching, we'll still allow that. So we can write around that if you want to. Um, if I uh, go back to my code again, I'll leave that there. That's a, it's the fastest way of doing it is to do that, just to ask the physics system directly how many things are touching me, how many are touching me, da, 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 all down the line. But if you're finding it's problematic because your balls aren't quite touching by 0.001, and it is very annoying when you see it, you're like, I want to touch these three, and it refuses to do it because they're not touching. Um, we can do a slightly more performance uh, intensive version where we sort of scan for touching items by hand when I tap. Uh, now, this requires a bit of mathematics. It's not a lot, quite frankly. Um, but it does give them a little bit of leeway to match things uh, more friendly. So, first things first, we're going to write a method that calculates the distance from one ball to another ball. We'll say, uh, func distance from some ball to another ball returns a CG flow. Uh, now, I hope uh, at school you went through uh, the uh, endless brilliant work of uh, Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, you should know that if you get the, the, uh, the my position against his, and then this one against the, the y against its other one, and uh, subtract them, or add them together and multiply it by itself, uh, you end up with the hypotenuse. So you have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, that's the mathematics behind it. It's not very hard. It's sort of um, grade school mathematics. But it's really easy to do here. Um, but there's one catch, which is that uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, the distance squared from our thing to its thing. Uh, and it's very, very common to see developers say, fine, I've got the square distance. What I care about is the regular distance. So they'll do a square root operation, uh, which is usually, in fact, nearly always a bad idea in games. Please don't do square roots in games, particularly for high performance checks like this one, where there's a lot of them happening. Um, so it's a better idea to leave it squared and use a square instead of doing a square root. As you'll see, I'm gonna say uh, return from dot position dot x minus two dot position dot x star from position x minus two dot position dot x plus from position y minus two position y times from position y minus, oops, minus two position y. Probably started correctly, may have been a mistake. 
from position X, to position X, from position X, to position X, from position Y, to position Y, from position Y, to position Y. Fine. That will return us the uh, distance between the center of one ball to the center of another ball squared. So we can now check if that is less than a certain amount. Uh, so I'm going to go and write a new method here, still called get matches. So func uh, get matches from start ball, a ball, and we're going to uh, always keep the square here. So again, with um, Pythagoras' theorem, you end up with a sort of c squared, the hypotenuse squared, um, which is fine for one-off checks. You can just do a square root on that, um, but a better idea is to leave it squared because that way you know it's a bit of a bit more formants, less operation. It's, it's much faster to work with. So I'll say let match width how far away a ball can be equal to our start ball frame width times our start ball frame width. So we're squaring the width of our ball, having a nice big gap of our, our ball here. Oops, sorry, uh, frame dot width. A nice big gap there to make sure it's a really big matching area to scan for around the space. And we'll add a bit more space just to be sure. There's a nice big distance here. We can then say for node in children, go over all the nodes in the entire screen. We'll say uh, guard let ball equals a node as a ball, else continue. If that failed, just bail out. Then guard let ball dot name is equal to start ball dot name, else continue. Uh, then we'll say let distance equals our distance from start ball to the ball in question and make sure that distance is less than our match width, the maximum we're willing to check for, else continue. This is a nice big broad distance to checking for, being very, very generous with our distance here and you'll see it makes quite a difference in gameplay. Uh, check we've got that much going by, oops, actually get guard just ball name, sorry, done guard let again, dear me. And then again, if match balls, uh, not match balls, uh, dot contains ball, then we will match balls dot insert the ball and call from there, get matches from ball. Like that. So that is a, a slightly different, definitely slower, but significantly more generous get matches function. That will return way more balls than the previous get matches call and that's fine. Being generous is not a bad idea in games, otherwise this game is rather tricky. Um, so we're being really, really generous here with our matching uh, call. Um, but we can now say, now that this all works correctly, is when we match stuff, which is uh, da -da 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 down here, we're just calling remove from parent right now, uh, which is going to just remove the ball from the parent, which is fine. But of course, we want to modify the score. We want to say before this loop, we want to say score plus equals some amount based on how many things they matched. Uh, now, someone said using pow on the right, pow is a great choice here. I'm gonna use pow and you'll see where it causes hiccups because uh, pow, as uh, Baz said in the chat, is enjoyable in Swift because it gets confused between decimals or CG floats and ints and so forth. You gotta be really explicitly clear what you mean when you do a pow. So I'm gonna say our score, add to it the integer of, the power of two, raise to the power of a double, because you've got to typecast this thing, of min match balls dot count and 16. So don't let them match more than 16 balls at a time for adding to their score. So it's going to add a very large number to their score potentially. It could be, you know, 8, 16, 32, 64, whatever, or 16 million, 777,216. Some some large numbers, that's that's 24, but you see what I'm saying? It could be a, a large number added to the system here um, with that score pal. But we're capping it, otherwise it gets a bit strange. Anyway, uh, so that now, should hopefully, if I, I can start playing the game now. If I run it back again and go over here, I can try running the game, try matching stuff. It should be more generous in its matching, like way more generous, which is a good thing. And hopefully modify the score as well. So our press is yellows here, boom, 32,000 points. Good job, Hudson. It's means reds, a few points here, uh, a few purples here. There we go. 
but it's much easier to match larger groups now uh, because the matching is really super generous which is great you know it's honestly it, it's your game make it match as strictly or as tightly as you want uh, it's it's down to you it's, it's your game after this you can do what you like Whew. okay let's head back to Red's code again enough playing with uh, sprite kit uh, the next step is to make removing balls more interesting because we're just saying oops we're just saying oh not me not storyboard we're just saying uh, remove dot parent right now uh, remove from parent right now which isn't very interesting it just gets rid of the ball straight away um, a better idea is to add some particle effects which are super easy to do uh, in uh, sprite kit they're lovely I can just press command n and look for a particle there we are a sprite kit particle file choose next based on fires fine fire looks good I'll call my thing explosion and we'll enter the sprite kit particle editor uh, now it gives you default sort of settings to make this a nice sort of fire effect which is fine uh, I've gone through and used trial and error to find a better system that looks more like a, a puff of I don't know glow I don't know what I call it that just looks better when these balls disappear uh, and the settings I've found that look quite nice are a birth rate super high like 5,000 or so just fire as many as you can all at once but cap it to be a hundred so it'll fire 100 of the particles and then stop. Then fire another 100 and stop in our editor here. But it'll only fire 100 once. So you get a nice puff of, of stuff disappearing. Uh, for uh, lifetime, really short. Make these things live only a little bit of time. I'll do 0.5 with a range of one. So some live a bit longer, some a bit less long, but they'll range on the screen for a various amount of time. Position range is how much it can appear left to right. So I'll do uh, zero for that one and zero for Y. So they all appear from the same sort of dot, the center of the thing. Uh, for angle range, it's 20 degrees by default, so a little cone pointing upwards. I'm gonna say you'd be 360. So it'll fire in all directions like that. Uh, alpha speed dictates how quickly these things fade out. I want them to go real quick. So I'm gonna say minus two. So you get it disappear almost straight away. And for scale speed, it's minus 0.5 by default, which means they sort of scale away slowly. I'm gonna use minus 1.5. They scale the small dots much, much faster. It's a really tiny little dot I end up with. And finally, color ramp set to this sort of brown color by default. I'm gonna use uh, white instead, like that. Boom, beautiful. So now we have this lovely particle effect when we pop our marbles. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead back to game scene, not Swift. And um, when we have remove from parent, that's a bit boring. I really want to add particles there instead. I'm going to say if let particles equals, uh, oops, sorry, SK emitter node with a file named explosion. That's our explosion SKS file we just made. So if that's exceeded, which it always should, but you know, no, I'm doing it safely here. If that worked, we will do particles dot position equals ball dot position place our new path limiter node over the ball that's being destroyed. Then add that to our game scene using particles. When you add the particles to the scene, they'll fly out and disappear and so forth, scale away and whatever on the screen. But the emitter node, the thing that made them, will still remain there. Even after all its particles have disappeared off the screen, the node itself still remains there, which isn't great because it means you're adding nodes all the time. So what we're gonna do is rem remove the particle node after a couple of seconds have passed. So we know all the particles have gone and then we can get rid of them if you want to. Uh, Alex's question, can the color of the particles inherit the ball's color? Yes, they can. Um, you'd have to make uh, this thing, balls, into a dictionary where you had like the ball name as its key and a UI color, or sorry, SK color as its value. Because then you could look up the ball name in your di your dictionary to get its color out and use that for the particle color. Um, it it might not look so good. Um, I, I did try them out, and and because the balls are brightly colored and the particle effect's quite small, you can't really see as much as clearly as you have with the white thing. I did try it, but I didn't think it looked quite as good. Anyway, um, where are we down here? Right, so we add the thing to the scene. We want to destroy the particle node after some seconds have passed. All the particles have gone, we can now safely get rid of the particle emitter as well. 
So we're going to say let remove after dead equals an sk action sequence. So a number of things. We're going to say sk action dot wait for duration three seconds. So after three seconds have passed, then we'll say uh, sk action dot remove from parent. So wait three seconds and remove it from the screen. We can then say particles dot run remove after dead. So they'll fire all the particles in one lump and get rid of it straight away. I press Command R to build and run. Switch back to my little iPad, which is down here. Is there a compiler or just very slow? No, it's just very slow. Excellent. <laughs> cool. Lovely. Thanks, Swift. Okay. See this works. Ha, pow. Pow. Look at that. Beautiful. The nice thing about particles is you can sit and monkey around with them for hours until they look exactly as you want. So go ahead, noodle around with these particles all you want to later on. Make them exactly as you want. Ah, good point score there, Hudson. Good job. Uh, noodle around later on and get it exactly as you want because you'll feel much, much better. I'm going to line up a massive one somehow. All these reds up here can come together, can't they? These purples can come down. These greens come down. Big red chunk there. Yeah. 140,000 points. Okay. Anyway. Sorry. You can get stuck playing this game really, really easily. Whew. Okay. How are we doing for time? Seven o'clock. Should I stop? Should I continue on? Do a bit more, perhaps? You decide. Tell me the chat window. Had enough sprite kit? Or do you want to do a bit more sprite kit? See where else this game can take us. I wonder if I can do polls on YouTube. Can you do polls on YouTube? I've got no idea. Tell me in the chat window whether you've had enough sprite kit or more. <laughs> okay. I think you are uh, voting for <laughs> more sprite kit. Rob, I have time. You know, I've got time. My kids are in bed. I can't go anywhere. I have loads of time. I can spend all the time in the world doing sprite kit. Okay. All right, I get it. You want Sprite Kit? Thank you very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna do more Sprite Kit. Here we go. Uh, you'll see I provided you with uh, in the assets catalog uh, this thing here, OMG two uh, X, um, and we're gonna place that on the screen when they get a particularly high number of matches. Uh, so if you remember, um, we have this matched ball set that tells us how many balls were matched, and we can use that uh, in here like this uh, if match balls dot count is greater than or equal to some number uh, now for testing purposes uh, I'm gonna use quite a low number so I haven't got to try and find a massive match group on this uh, screen live because that would be embarrassing I'm gonna say uh, five is probably doable in, in, a, in a live stream um, you probably want like you know 12 or maybe even 16 or something really high in there uh, if they match a lot of balls at the same time, we're gonna show the OMG thing on the screen and make it fly in nicely. So we'll say, uh, let OMG equals an SK sprite node. Uh, image named uh, is OMG. Then we'll do OMG.position equals a CG point. Uh, X is our mid X. Uh, y is frame.mid Y, so center it on the screen. Uh, by default, we want this thing to appear above everything else. So, you know, 100 places it, same level as the score. So it'll be super high above the uh, balls. We're going to make it by default also scale super small, like 0 0.001. Uh, the same for the Y scale as well. Uh, like really tiny in the screen, so you can't even see it really. We'll make it sort of fly in, pause a little bit, then fly out. So it sort of zooms up, see it, still stay still for a little bit, then fly out again quite quickly. So you don't want to get in the way of the game, but just to say, wow, you've got a really high number of balls, which is fantastic. So we'll do uh, let appear equals, scroll down slightly, let appear equals an SK action group. So sequences of things that appear first, then another one, then another one, another one in order. A group all run at the same time. So I'll say our group is going to be SK action dot scale to one, so 100% of its size. Christoph, someone said that already. Possibly, possibly uh, using frame center. I haven't checked it. I'm always a bit wary because I modified the anchor position fairly freely. Uh, I'm always a bit careful like that, but you're probably right. I expect frame center is actually fine. Um, duration 0 0.25. 
So scale up to 100% over a quarter of a second. But also we want to do SK action, uh, action dot fade in with duration 0.25. So it scales in and fades in at the same time. Then we'll do let disappear equals SK action dot group uh, SK action dot scale to two. So go to double its size again over a quarter of a second. And SK action dot fade out with duration 0.25. And the whole thing's going to be a sequence. So run this one, then pause, then run another one. We'll say SK action dot sequence, an array of appear, followed by SK action dot wait for duration 0.25, then disappear. So it'll fade in, hold still, fade out, like that. And finally, omg.run that sequence. Let's find out if I screwed that up. I'll press Command R to build and run. Uh, switch to my iPad again, which is loitering down here. Okay, so hopefully if I can match five at once, and I've gone to chunk of blues, I did not work. Ah, I did not call add child. Uh, don't forget to call add child, otherwise you'll have nothing appear. <laughs> don't do that. Don't be like me. Call add child. Let's try that again. This time with 100% less fail, hopefully. Well, we'll find out. Let's try again. So I can find a nice block of five. And there's loads here. Boom. There we go. OMG. And smaller blocks like this three here, nothing happens. Big blocks like this yellow block here, OMG appears. But you'll see it sort of slides in, um, pauses in the screen, then slides out again. It's really nice. Any chance of metal, ask Deepal. No, never is your answer. Go and buy Janie Clayton's book. Um, I am never touching metal. I have no interest in metal for a number of very important and serious reasons. Okay, so um, there's only a, a really one more thing I want to show you, which is uh, the... Uh, speed at which you can add special effects to Sprite Kit. Not enough folks know about this, which is a real shame because uh, it's extremely powerful. Um, it's also extremely easy to screw up when you're doing a live stream like this. So be prepared for utter failure. If I screw this up, and I say if, when I screw this up, I'll just correct it later on and put the actual code onto the GitHub uh, thing where it'll definitely not be screwed up. But here, typing it live, um, I'm going to get it wrong. And I'm, I'm saying it honestly because um, the technique to load these special effects in the sprite kit gives you very, very little debugging information. It'll say, it didn't work. That's it. And it's like, great, I've written some code. Why doesn't it work? Which line's broken? And it'll tell you almost nothing. So if this goes wrong, um, lol, quite frankly. You were here to watch it go hideously wrong. What we're going to do is... Uh, we're going to spruce up the background a little bit. Now, I'm not sure how much you can see of the background. Uh, if I go to... Uh, Chris Apps, if that's Janie's book, I'll, I'll show the link. If it's not Janie's book, I don't want to show it because Janie's book's brilliant. Go and buy Janie's book. Let me know which book that is. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hide our balls temporarily by getting rid of line 59. So you'll be able to see, hopefully, the background in all its magnificent glory. Um, isn't terribly interesting right now. We should see, all being well, uh, over here. Boom, hopefully you can see on the screen, not sure what you can see, a sort of uh, gray, dark gray uh, checkerboard effect going on there. Um, it's fine, we can do better than that, we can make it more interesting, we could say something like, um, down here, we're gonna say uh, background.run. Oh, it is excellent, good. Janie Clayton's book is good, go and buy Janie's book on metal. Um, anyway. Uh, but I'm going to run an SK action that repeats forever another SK action, which is going to be uh, rotate by angle pi over 10 seconds. Uh, one more, there we go. So that'll make our, our background uh, checkerboard thing just go around and around gently on the screen. Make it look slightly better, but still a bit boring. Hopefully, let's find out how it looks. Uh, where's my thing? 
There it goes. So the background spins around gently now, better than nothing. It adds a bit of spice to the whole thing, but not a lot. To make this better, we're going to add a fragment shader, um, which again has almost no useful debugging in the system. I'm using it here, um, so it's gonna be a challenge if I screw this up. I won't even be able to tell you why it screwed up. I have to put it on GitHub afterwards. Um, but we're gonna make a particle, uh, fragment shader, sorry, that modifies the way this texture is rendered. Now, if you've never used fragment shaders before, there are two important things you need to know. Uh, one is they're not written in Swift. Now, I've left this to the end at like, you know, 10 past seven after our hours sort of gone by. Um, because they're not written in Swift, they're written in GLSL, the GL uh, shading language. Uh, and that's why that's last, because this is Swift on Sundays, not GLSL on Sundays. Uh, it's a different coding language. The second thing is, this thing gets run on every point in our graphic. Every pixel in our graphic gets run through this shader. It's a miniature program. And it will say, for this pixel, here's your color, what do you want to do? And it'll tell us the color of the pixel, it'll tell us at the time we're on, and we can use that to make something interesting. So I'm gonna try and make a fragment shader here, live on YouTube, knowing full well it could go hideously wrong. Let's find out. I'm going to say, I'm removing iPad from top of Xcode. What does that mean? Oh, sorry, oh, you wanna see the screen behind it? Fine, there you go, there's a screen behind it, I admit. Um, I'm gonna press Command N to make a new file. And I'm gonna scroll down to find empty file. I'm gonna call this thing, this is our, our um, fragment shader for the background. So I'm gonna call it background.fsh. FSH is commonly used for fragment shaders. Uh, if you are old school, these things were called pixel shaders, but fragments are a new cool way of calling these things. Anyway, fragment shaders. Uh, and we can try and write this thing. It's written in GLSL, which is a C-like language with a lot of different things, and they're highly optimized. There is no room for screwing things up because they run every pixel simultaneously. So I'll do void main. And in here, the first thing I'm going to do is figure out how fast to make our rippling effect, to make the background more exciting. How fast to make that happen. So I'll make a new float called speed. This is gonna be equal to the current time. So this thing's gonna change as time goes by on the screen. And that's given to us automatically in shaders and a, and a thing called U time. That's the current time value. We're also gonna multiply that by another value, which we're not given, but we'll pass in from Swift called speed. How fast to make this thing go. So we get the system time, the current clock of our fragment happening, happening right now, multiplied by a speed value that we will specify out there. So we can control the same, make it go faster or slower whenever we want to using these values we input. But those two together make the really large values, like massive values, it'll be a crazy fast effect. So we're gonna modify this, multiply it down by 0.05, bring it way down in speed so it goes much, much slower more smooth effect. Next up, we're gonna provide a strength parameter. How strong to make our bulging effect on the screen. So we'll say float strength equals the strength that we get passed in. Again, we'll pass it in from Swift code so we can configure it in Swift, it's very nice. By the way, if you're not sure, if you haven't used GSL before, uh, U stands for a uniform, which is basically a value being passed in at, at build time, anyway. The strength, we want this thing to happen. And again, we're gonna bring that way down in size. We can multiply or divide, it doesn't really matter. We'll divide it by 100.0. So we make it a tiny fraction of the value specify. Now doing this means in Swift code, we can say, try strength five, try strength six, try strength 10 or 20, rather than try strength 0.001, try strength 0.0011 and so forth. It's much nicer having big values in Swift than bringing them down to size in a GLSL like this. So that is the speed, how fast to make our effect happen, and the strength, how notable to make this thing. The next thing we want to do is get our current coordinate, figure out where on the screen this pixel is, this fragment is, which dot we're modifying currently. That's provided to us again by GLSL in a thing called vtex coord. I'm gonna write vec2 coord 
equals v tex coord. So this thing specifies the x and y coordinate of this pixel in our whole texture. So it'll say, hey, 0, 0, you're the top left corner, 100, 100, you're the bottom right corner, whatever it is, right? Some, some position inside there, well, 1, 1 perhaps, but some position inside there that represents where this pixel is in the grand scheme of our whole texture. That's vtex coord. We're taking a copy of it though. We're saying call a copy of that thing coord. So we can modify it freely to make our bulging effect. Vec2 is a vector 2. It means an x and a y, like a CG point in GLSL. Now what we're going to do is modify this pixel's coordinate. We're going to say, okay, you were this one here. We want you to be this value over here instead. So we're going to map the texture, the pixel from here, to the pixel over here. We're going to move pixels around on the screen. This creates a ripple effect. We're saying, you know, draw yourself as if you were positioned somewhere else. So it creates a, an interesting bulging effect. I want this to be nice and smooth. So we're going to use a circle effect using sine and cosine. This is where, if anywhere, I screw it up. Let's find out. We're going to say our coordinates x value, it's x value, plus equals, plus equals the sine of our coordinate x plus our speed multiplied by some other value we're going to pass in, which will be how often we create these bulges on the screen. And that's going to be called frequency. So I'll say, frequency. So we've got time, the current clock of our uh, fragmentator running, the speed, how fast to make our effect move, the strength, how big to make it, and the frequency, how many to make on the screen. So multiply the whole thing by the frequency, and multiply all of that by the strength. So make it stronger or less strong as needed. So like that. Then I'll copy and paste, which is probably where I get it wrong. Uh, our y coordinate we're going to add the cosine of the coordinate y plus the speed times the frequency times the strength. So we've said, okay, you were here. I want you to instead pretend you're actually here. So we can now read the value of the color at that point and use that here instead. So we can grab different positions around it. So what it, it, it was originally say, zero, zero, we're gonna move down to one, one and say, okay, if your color value, use one, one's color value. So it moves the, the pixels around the image in interesting ways. So now there's one, if there's any single thing you have to know inside GSL, it's this, uh, it's GL frag color. You set that to be the final output color value for this pixel, for this thing. What should it be? And it's going to be a texture 2D, which means read into our texture. Which texture? Our texture, that's U texture, the uniform texture, our texture, at that position. So find our position, our modified position, and read the pixel in our texture at that modified position. Then modify it by V color mix dot A which means if this pixel is transparent, leave it as transparent in the new one as well. Now, I'm sure I read it as quickly in my head to make sure I haven't screwed this up. I've got void main, float, float speed equals u time, u speed, 0, 0, 5, good. Float strength, u strength, 5, 100, good. Semicolons, by the way, it required here, sadly. Um, vec2 coord equals vtex coord. Coord x is sin coord x plus speed plus u frequency times strength. Coord y is cosine coord y plus speed times frequency times strength. G L fractal is texture D, U texture coord, V color mix A. That looks fine to me. I think I might not have screwed that up. Um, so now to make that work, like I said, uh, U times passed in for us. That's the time ticking of the clock in our game. Uh, v text coords passed in. That is the, the uh, coordinate we were supposed to be drawing into. Uh, we have uh, frag color, that's what we're outputting, that's the final result of our thing. And texture's passed in as well. So the whole thing, uh, sorry, actually, V-color is passed in as well. What matters is now, we've got to pass in values for the speed, how fast to make it move, the strength, how pronounced to make the effect, and the frequency, how many of these things to make. So, 
want to pass those three values in from Swift. Let's see if I've screwed this up or not. I'll go back to our uh, Swift file again and say we have a uniforms array, oops, lowercase, let uniforms, that is a, the GLSL term for values I am passing in when I create my shader. Uh, this is an array of SK uniform equal to SK uniform with the name U speed and a float value of one. So we can modify 0.9 or 1.1 or 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever you want to. Uh, it's just an array of numbers that you like. And an SK uniform with the name, name of U strength. I have a strength value. I've been doing trial and error here. I found three looks quite nice. And finally, SK uniform with a name of U frequency and a float of 20. I've tested them out, they look quite nice, but by all means, if the GLSL is correct, you can in theory go ahead and modify those to be less uh, your own style, if you want to. Then we say let shader equals an SK shader using the file named background and shader.uniforms, the values you want to pass into this thing, well, that is our uniforms array, like that. And finally, background dot shader equals shader. Now this is the moment of truth. If I have utterly muffed this up, um, we're going to know in about 10 seconds. <laughs> no. Oh, GSL. If only there's some sort of decent debugging out of you. Let's find out. Let's build and run and see what happens here. Oh, yes. Do you see that? Uh, so what you should now see is this fantastic ripple effect going through our checkerboard as it spins around, as if balls are poking through like a canvas. Um, it looks weird, it looks interesting, and it's basically free. Um, it's done by the GPU at lightning fast speed. Um, these things come free of charge in Sprite Kit. You know, they're basically, these things are so powerful nowadays, you can do any sprite shaders you like, because um, you think Unity applies way more than these. This kind of level will not travel any vaguely modern device. I said iPad Air 2 will run this uh, in, in, in its ease, quite frankly. It'll have no problems. Um, they're blazingly fast. And this is when you see, you know, new devices have a thousand fragment shaders or 5,000, whatever it is, big, big numbers. They can run that simultaneously 5,000 times. It's extremely fast. Uh, now, what I've actually made here is a water effect, which makes like a lovely rippling of things. So you can use this as a water effect anywhere in your games, in any number of objects, and it will look blazingly fast. Um, so a question from Andrea, not sure where Utime or Vtex Core come from. They come from Sprite, uh, from um, GLSL. They're passed into us automatically. They're like global values for all fragment shaders to spare. What is the current time? And Vtex Coward is, where is my position inside the larger uh, texture? And it gets passed into us automatically by the system. So I'm going to worry about it. So now finally, we can uncomment add child, bring our balls back in and witness, hopefully, the finished game. We should see uh, all the balls taking place. We should see physics happening. We should see the particle effects happening. We've got tilting going on. We've got fragment shaders going on. There's all sorts. You should see the nice big OMG there. 65,000 points. That's the most you can earn at any one point. Boom. OMG. Yes, Hudson, you're amazing anyway. <laughs> there we go. This game is pretty much finished. Obviously, there's still more to do. You know, how do you end the game? And I think realistically, you want to say, if the count of remaining balls is less than a certain number, then say, okay, you can't make any more matches. Stop playing. Um, that's for you to figure out in your own time, quite frankly. But for us, that finishes our stream. So we've covered stacks of stuff. I'm showing the iPad. Sorry, there you go. So I'm sitting there playing the game, not showing the iPad. Sorry. I'm doing, I'm doing great. You, you missed some amazing scores there, Nicola. <laughs> I was doing so well. Um, so anyway, I'll put this code onto GitHub so you can try it out, modify it, make it your game, ship it if you want to. I don't really care what you do with it. Um, it's down to you now. Uh, so that ends our project for today. I've got to try and make myself stop playing this thing now. It's a bit compulsive. It's like popping, um, popping bubbles in bubble wrap, you know? Um, so it is quite compulsive to play. Uh, actually, a brilliant uh, story is that uh, Sid Meier, the game maker, 
had to delay his game after he made Pirates. Because the game Pirates was so damn good, he couldn't stop playing it. Um, so, it's a bit like that here. It's a bit compulsive, sort of popping the little coloured coloured balls and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to stop, stop, stop. I'm going to quit. I'm going to be on it all day. So, that ends our session. Um, as usual, we've gone over by 25 minutes, sorry. Um, but that ends our session. So, if you have any questions more generally about the game or um, about Sprite Kit, about anything else, quite frankly, across the board, now is your chance to ask it. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Uh, tension Sheets, Daryl Booth, fellow Red Dwarf fan. Love it. Tension Sheets, love them. I'm glad to hear Chris Knapps. I can highly recommend, by the way, if you want to do more GLSL, um, I have a whole library of these things uh, on GitHub. Pre-written fragment shaders you can just drop in uh, on GitHub. So if I get this over here, you will see, oops, in slow motion, there's my repo. It's called Shader Kit. Uh, and it includes various things. And you'll see in there is the water shader we use today, plus other ones, plus things like, uh, what are they gonna get here? There's a checkerboard, there is a circle wave, there's a rainbow wave and so forth. Um, there's all sorts here going on in terms of different styles you can use. Uh, and they're pre-written fragment shaders you can just get and use in your games free of charge, do what you like with them. Um, and there's, you know, it'll do static and so forth. You see the water effect in there and similar embossing. Um, so go and grab that if you want to learn more GLSL. Actually, the, the, that project was written as a sort of labor of love from me because uh, I wanted not only to do fragment shaders, but also to tell other folks how to do fragment shaders. Because it's one thing me doing them, but another thing someone else learning how to do them. So if you want to look at, say, how does uh, radial gradient work, for example, just with by on the screen. There's a water effect, not nice. That lovely water effect. It's gorgeous. Anyway, uh, if you want to see how they work, you can go into those shaders and say, how does uh, radial gradient work? And you'll see not only do I comment what all the uniforms do, but also I recommend values to use and so forth and colors to use. There's my license there. And I comment every line of code so you can see exactly how it works. So there's no like, oh, what does this thing do? That's exactly how it works there. Um, so you'll find lots of description there uh, about how to use fragment shaders. Um, and there's, again, it describes here more generally, you know, what's a bool, what's a vec2. Here are the various functions you might want to use, like you know, sine and cosine and distance and so forth. Here's uniforms explained more clearly. You know, I went a lot of work documenting it. And everyone has a description describing how they work as well with variants and uniforms and so forth. There is stacks of documentation there. Go and check out Shader Kit on GitHub. It only has like 20, 229 stars. It's, it's feeling lonely. Go and check out Shader Kit because it's full of stacks of things. And I've documented it as best I can to make it a brilliant learning resource for folks who want to uh, learn GLSL. Because it's there in Sprite Kit and in, in Scene Kit. Um, you can do amazing shader stuff super fast, um, more or less for free. So go and check that out. Uh, sorry, enough of my sales pitch. <laughs> Actually, no, one more sales pitch. I've got a whole book based on Sprite Kit, and it's brilliant. I wrote this book, and it's a, a crazy idea I had, uh, and it actually worked. Um, and the idea was based on choose your own adventure. These books I've read when I was a kid, like, you know, page one, you're in a dungeon. If you want to turn left, turn to page 29. If you want to turn right, turn to page 54, whatever. As you read, you kind of branch through the book, uh, and... Uh, it evolves, and by the end of it, say, oh, you know, you are dead, and you can go back to where you were and try again, choose a different choice. Uh, and I made a book about Sprite Kit that follows that exact thing. You decide how the game should evolve, and I've never seen this done before or since. The tutorial adapts based on the choices you make. So it'll say, okay, should this game be about submarines or be about space rockets? Should it use motion or should it use taps? Should you want to score by collecting things or by avoiding things? And the tutorial adapts as you go. You get different words, different source code, different assets and so forth as you progress. I've never seen anything like it before and it actually works. And you get the whole thing as an EPUB, so you can tap on links to browse through your choices and so forth. But also you get an iPad app, you can run back and make choices live in the thing, see the source code next to it, what you have right now, and press play at any point to see how the game looks at that point. It's absolutely brilliant. As I say, there's 200 plus combinations you can work through in the game across four projects. It was great fun to make. Uh, so check it out. It was actually really, really fun to make. And I think there's nothing else like it I've seen so far, or since, in fact. Uh, it's, just, it's just brilliant. Anyway, 
Go and check that out. All right, that's it. No more sales pitches, probably. We'll see. <laughs> okay, now is the time. If you have any questions, I've got another sort of half hour or so. If you have any questions, uh, go ahead and ask in the chat window. I will do my best for us to respond, uh, and we'll see how we get on. Grimico, I'm glad you liked the book. Thank you very much. It was it was so much fun to write. Yeah, so Chris Stapp's uh, Strike It can be used, and it was added to, I remember being there when it was added to um, Watch OS. And I was like, why, why would you want Watch OS? But they use it a lot. They use it a lot for doing high performance animations, because it's actually really nice for doing high performance anima animations. Uh, question from Jeep Luke How hard is it to add a taptic engine? Oh, it's trivial. Really easy to do. It's a few lines of code. Uh, Baz, according to a stream, I look into performance debug with instruments. That's possible. So my current um, Swift on Sundays approach is let's make apps. Let's make an app each time. And at some point, we'll hit a project where I cannot squeeze it into one hour or even like an hour and a half. We'll have to do two hours or two two weeks of it, perhaps. But I definitely want to get into techniques. You know, when I've had enough doing apps, which could be in a month, could be in three months, could be in nine months, maybe. Um, we'll get into apps and techniques. And then, yes, instruments is a very good idea. Um, I would say I did a talk once on instruments at Pragma in Verona two years ago, uh, and I recorded all the instrument sections. I videoed them. Here's me using instruments as a video. Because instruments is really, really good at saying, nope, I refuse to work. And you've got to restart your Mac to get it to work. Um, and when that happens, obviously I can't restart my Mac because uh, I am streaming. So it's like, ah, oh, so there's no instruments then. Yay, that was the end of our live stream. Um, so I'm, I'm wary of doing instruments. We'll see. Question from Robert, what do I use for my graphics and animations? I use uh, all of Creative Cloud from Adobe. I use Stacks, I use Photoshop, I use After Effects, I use Illustrator, I use InDesign. I use all sorts of After Effects. I love them all in their own unique way. Apart from Illustrator, which can die in a fire, quite frankly. Um, for what reasons are you not into metal? Um, so metal is the underlying layer where uh, Sprite Kit runs, where Sync Kit runs, where um, Core Animation runs, where Unity runs, where they all run. They all hit metal really these days because metal's very, very fast. But what people don't understand is that metal's very, very hard. It takes a lot of work. Ronald, thank you very much. Also, epically cool Nintendo last name for games. Very topical, I like it. Um, um, metal's very hard. It takes a lot of work to draw a triangle on the screen. If you read Janie's book, go read Janie's book. I've got it over here. Oh, it's over there somewhere, I can see it. Um, uh, and it's like, it takes a lot of work to make a triangle. And that's fine. I don't mind doing a lot of work. I've done OpenGL in the past. You know, it's not a problem doing a lot of work. The problem is that making high performance metal is hard. So when you say, hey, hey, Sprite Kit, add this shader here, add this thing here, draw that thing here. Behind the scenes, Sprite Kit's doing some extremely advanced metal to get you those results. And yes, you could drop down to metal, write it yourself. But there's a very, very good chance you'll be slower. I mean, significantly slower. Because Sprite Kit, Scene Kit, Core Animation, blah, blah, they have pre-optimized themselves to be faster. So you'll get better results by using those frameworks than you would doing Metal. Uh, and the same is true of if you write some Swift code, you said, okay, this bit's really important. I'm gonna optimize this with some assembly. Um, fine, you can write assembly language in ARM64. Of course you can. There's a good chance you'll write slower ARM64 than the Swift compiler because they can optimize it at a machine level significantly better than you can using decades of research into compiler optimization. They'll do a better job. So the same is true uh, of Metal. When you say, I want to use Sprite Kit or Scene Kit, you get all these amazing performance boosts free of charge. They run blazingly fast. So you haven't got to worry about Metal. So I recommend it. Christoph, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed the stream. Uh, sorry, I was quite long with an answer. Are there any more questions you had to ask me? Uh, Andrea has a question about physics and Sprite Kit. Is there any other cool thing to do? Uh, obvious gravity weight. Well, you can do gravity weight. Um, you can do uh, velocity. You can do force. You can do density and mass. Um, I mean, literally just type it into the Xcode and see what comes up, more or less. 
Um, so here, if we just do ball dot physics body question mark dot. Uh, da -da -da -da. So how, how much to slow it down when it's spinning around? Give it a spin or not give it a spin? Give it a push in the right direction? Um, what should collide with? How dense it is? How rough it is around the edges? There's a, a lot, lots you can do. Oh, you can't see Xcode, sorry. I'm just reading out to you what Xcode can see, sorry. Um, oh, there's one more here that's worth discussing just briefly, actually. If I put Xcode on again, here, if I want to show you one thing just quickly, which is you may be interested in, which is uses precise collision detection, um, which is, um, so by default, it uses an optimized collision system. Did this thing collide or not? Um, and if you use the precise version, it will expend more work. It'll be a lot slower doing precise collision detection, um, but it'll be more accurate. And it's particularly problematic where, if you imagine sort of a, a, a sheet of paper, or something, a wall here, and you fire an arrow at the wall, uh, and you imagine the physics is ticking. Tick, 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 tick. It ticks as it flies through. If you've got a very, very fast thing flying through, it might be here on one tick, and here on the next tick, and not have collided. It might have passed through in the time it took to render the um, physics simulation. Um, and that's problematic because it will have passed through the wall, which shouldn't happen, of course. So for very fast moving, small things, you can enable precise collision detection and it will render, it will it'll calculate its movement as well and say on the way between ticks, did it hit the wall going through it or not? If it did, it will collide and uh, bounce off or trigger your code if you want to do. Um, so you can do that. I would say it is extremely performance intensive. Do it very carefully. Uh, we're using circular physics here, which is a nice, easy one to do. If you use a texture physics where it draws out the alpha as a path, that's slow full stop. If you combine that with precise collision detection, the combination is slow. So use it carefully, use it wisely, and test on old iPads. Go and grab your iPad Air 2, whatever runs iOS 12. I think that's probably the, late, the old one that runs iOS 12. Maybe iPad where Air 1 runs iOS 12, I'm not sure. Anyway. It's like four years old. That's a good bench benchmark as an old iPad. Grab that and test it on there thoroughly before you enable it too much. Uh, Smongo, how important would it be to use SK shape nodes? You know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, shape nodes used to be used to be really, really bad. In iOS 7, when SpriteKit launched, they were terrible in terms of performance. It got better. Um, so I, I suspect at this point, it's more or less the same. But try it out. Give it a try. It's not something I would do personally. I'd rather use like rendered stuff. And what you know, what I like about doing games coding, and this is why I think a lot of coders should just try games coding in their spare time, just noodle around a little bit. It really forced you to think of optimization. It, you've got to really think about it because um, I remember years ago I made a clone of uh, the game Tie Fighter. It's an old game. Jason, thank you very much. Both Jasons, thank you very much. Very kind of you. I made a game, uh, a clone of the game TIE Fighter in um, DirectX 8 for Windows. This is, this is a long time ago, like 15, 16 years ago. Anyway, a long time ago. Uh, and it was brilliant. I had, you know, flying around. I had spaceships. I had the HUD. I had the little radar thing going on. And then I wanted to show a little readout at the bottom saying, you know, um, targeted the engine, something like that. And it totally ground to a halt. Because rendering text was slow, I mean really slow. I was doing an actual live font rendering on the screen and it was viciously slow and it brought it down from super fast to like one FPS, it's unplayable basically. Uh, and it forced you to think, okay, how can I get this thing to be faster? How can I make this code more efficient? Uh, and in that case, you render, of course, you render the whole font set into graphics and place them across the screen more efficiently. So it, I, I love making games, it makes you really, really think about performance efficiency across the board. Like, as I sit there going, you know, can I avoid a branch here? Like, can I get rid of one conditional here? So a condition inside a loop, you can save 100 branches immediately. And of course, branches hit performance massively. Uh, so, it, it, I, I love making games for that reason. It really makes you work hard to um, think about performance. Uh, any more questions? Let's have a look. Uh, Robert De Laurentiis, you want to review how we're touching? So Robert, we looked at two methods here, one called get matches, I'll, I'll bet I'll, I'll come with them both. This won't be happy because they're both called get matches at this point. 
Um, the first one uh, said, go over all the things that are touching me directly, like physically touching me, according to the physics engine. Um, check it's a ball. Check it's the same color as me by using the name. And check whether it matched it already. If so, mark it as matched. And call ourselves again, call get matches again from that ball. So it'll match on and on and on and on and on as we go. Um, so that's fine. Um, but this was it's difficult because the contacted bodies aren't necessarily what you think they are. Because you can look at it and say, well, they're touching. But the physics system will say, well, they're not touching. They're microns distant from each other or something like that, right? They're very, very close, but not touching. And so all contacted bodies is very fast, but a bit annoying. Um, I will switch to a much, much, much more generous system here. We multiply our width uh, by itself and add some extra padding. So it really scans a lot of space around it um, to find balls touching. And we use that by looping over all balls, doing the same thing. Are your ball? Are you the same color as me? What's your distance from me? Uh, if it's within the range that we care about, which is this distance here, then add ourselves to the match balls array and match from there. And in the distance from two method, oh, of course, sorry, let's go. Sorry, I'm, I'm being awful again. Um, in, in distance from two method, we um, use Pythagoras' theorem, where we say, get my um, uh, opposite, get my adjacent, um, multiply them together to get the square, a squared, b squared, it gives us c squared, our distance. So we know our x position, and we know our y position, and we know its x and its y. So we can say, subtract these two, subtract these two, or sorry, plus these two, give us the hypotenuse squared. It's Pythagoras' theorem, it's, it's sort of like, you know, 11 year old mathematics or something, it's fairly um, straightforward. Um, but we leave it squared to avoid the square root because square roots are expensive in games, full stop, that's expensive across the board. Um, so avoiding that's a good idea. We leave it squared, hence the multiplication up here, we square it ourselves, got our distance squared, or width squared, sorry, um, using that. So that's how it works. Hope that helped slightly more. Um, ah, Jerickson, thank you very much. It's very kind. I'm glad you enjoyed the stream. Are there any more questions? If so, I will uh, do my best to answer them. If not, we can wrap up. Andrea, well, like a 3D project and 3D scenes, um, maybe, maybe, I mean, it's possible. Sync it's very, very nice. Um, Sprite Kit is simpler, I find, to explain to people, to see on the screen how it works. It's very, very simple. Uh, so I prefer doing Sprite Kit. I could do Scene Kit. Eh, eh. We'll see. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not enamored with the idea of doing scene kit. Uh, Slack channel, I can write a link to the Slack channel if you like. Uh, invite people. Uh, copy the invite link. Copy, let's paste it in over here. That is my uh, thing there for the Slack channel. I'm glad you enjoyed the stream, Chris Daps. Um, Sprite Kit is great fun. I mean, it's so fast. It's been around since iOS 7. And I've tweaked it slightly, like um, in iOS 10, I think, they added the, the warp system, so you can add warping effects and so forth. Uh, it has these lovely attractor systems, so you can do like um, physics effects, like black holes and similar, which works great, by the way. If you looked at some of the, the shader kit um, fragment shaders, you can do a lovely black hole effect with that, sort of sucking in space around it, Plus the tractors do some really, really cool things. I was thinking of doing one of those games where you start to fire fire bullets around uh, planets and stuff, but yeah, it proved to be too hard to squeeze into an hour. Okay, last chance before I close up. You want to know more about fish? Um, 
Fish, I mean, I don't know what fish means to you, but for me, it's an SSH system. Um, but, you know, hey. Uh, question for Jeeper Luke. Is there any threshold for collision detection so you have to calculate the distance of balls? Not that I know of. Uh, you can read contacted bodies, not nearby bodies. Um, so it's problematic. I mean, the problem there is that it's 10 a.m. in uh, the west coast of the USA and even earlier in sort of Hawaii time. I, I can't please everyone. I did do one of them early. Uh, so um, I might do the one early. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Oh, oh, FSH fragment shaders, you mean? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much for explaining that. You want to know more about fragment shaders? Great. Break. Go and check out Sprite, um, Shader Kit. You'll see it's documented there in extreme detail. I've gone over as much as I can. If I've missed something off, let me know. Uh, Tenjan, yes, Sprite Kit works great on Mac. It works great on TVOS. Great, works great on WatchOS. And I try and include them all in uh, all my books. So I've got a great, really nice series of um, games for TVOS and Sprite Kit and the TVOS book I have. I've got some macOS Sprite Kit games in the macOS book. Uh, there's, even a, there's even, believe it or not, a great watchOS Sprite Kit game in Hacking with watchOS. And I was really pleased with this game. It's a lovely game. It was great on the watch. So I recommend that. Go and check it out. It's, a, it's really fun making Sprite Kit games on any of Apple's platforms. They look fantastic. If a screen requires async data, what's your preferred approach? Navigate the screen, have an empty view, and refresh. Uh, so my preferred approach is to navigate to the screen and have an empty view. Um, and there are ways around making that look good. If you go to um, hacking and swift slash example code, not that one, but the parent directory. If you look for uh, DZN empty data set, um, it'll explain how it works in there. Conrad, thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Um, this this shows you uh, on an empty table view, empty collection view, you can show information like, you know, uh, hey, tap, tap here to add your first friend or something like that. Uh, you can attribute strings using images and so forth. There's lots you can do in there. Um, I love using that. It looks really, really nice out of the box. Um, do I plan to do Swift on Sundays using Apple Watch? No, I don't. Um, Apple Watch is problematic because it has to bounce through the phone. So when you press play in Apple Watch, it installs the phone and then the phone to the watch, um, which is slow and it doesn't always necessarily work very quickly. So it's annoying. It'd be annoying for a live stream to do that on the watch. If it wasn't for that, it'd be great. Um, anyway. Uh, Mr. Huawei, in Apple Watch, you should use Sprite instead of UI Kit in non-game apps. Um, oh. That's a good question. I try to think where I've used it in non-game apps. I don't think I have. I think I always use Sprite Kit for games. Yeah, I think I always use it for games. I know Apple use their animations. They use like um, they use Sprite Kit for animations in um, WatchOS. Uh, I don't, but I know they can. Um, Varanchi, which of these codes can I put to multi-threading? Um, probably none of them. I mean, this particular game, there's no need to. Um, Multithreading is great, right? You know, your average iPhone these days has six CPUs, or uh, depending on its age, and the iPad's got you know a lot as well, um, which is great. Um, but unless you need it, you don't want to get into it because it causes problems. You know, it's, it, your brain doesn't think in a multithreaded way. We think in a very linear way. So I'd be, I'd be happy to go entirely single core until it was time to go multi-core, as I had no choice but to go multi-core, and then i think about it. But I, I'd optimize the heck out of my code first before going multi-threaded. Yes, particles to be is, um, is great for confetti. Um, you wanna use CA emitter layer for that, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful API, not enough note folks use. Um, and uh, you can use CA emitter layer in any UI view. I love using it. Um, you can add things flying around like confetti and similar. It looks great out of the box, um, adding effects over your UI view and similar. So I recommend that very much. And in fact, I made this article. Um, I don't know how to find it. Articles here. Um, snow? No. I made a snow scene thing as part of my. There we are. How do I get snow scene with core animation? Uh, and it adds like a background gradient at first. Then add the CA material on top so you get snow falling down. Then add uh, snow at the bottom using a CA shape layer. 
So you end up with uh, gradients and emitters and shapes all being drawn as part of the UI view with auto layout. It looks fantastic. Um, so I recommend emitter layout very much. It's fantastic. Question from Aegon the Conqueror. Is SpriteKit better than Unity? Well, SpriteKit's Swift, uh, which is great. Now, the, the code we wrote today, I know it's not a finished game, right? But we wrote a fair chunk of a game today. And it is 161 lines of code. That's including white space all over the place, plus comment at the top. So all in, maybe 120 lines of code, actual Swift code. And it's code we all understand, using all the benefits of Swift, uh, which is really nice. So I like the fact that uh, Swift is very, very easy for us to jump into, for Sprite Kick, it's the language we know, we trust. Whereas Unity is C-sharp, which is a great language, has its own merits, hasn't got optionals just yet, that's coming in C-sharp 8. Has its own cool things you can do instead, though. Um, so, you know, it's not like one or the other. KRIM, thank you very much. It's very kind of you. It's very generous. Uh, so, is it better? Obviously, Unity is cross-platform. So, you can deploy to Android. You can deploy to Switch. You can deploy to Windows or even Web, I believe, these days. Um, whereas SpriteKit, you can't. However, SpriteKit is just so easy to use. Just dive in. Start having Swift you know and love, and you've got a game in 120 lines of code. I mean, this is 120 lines of code or so, all in room white space and comments. And it looks, I think, great for the amount of work we've got, which is fantastic. How would I approach checking to see whether there are no more matches in this game? So it's not that no more matches I'd care about. It's that, I mean, like, at least one possible match is all I'd really care about. So what you could say is something like, um, uh, in update here, you want to do the least possible work. Now we have, um, duh, 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 we have one, two, three, four, five colors of balls, and we require at least three to happen at any given time. So we could do the maths on this and say, you know, you've got to be at least, if there's, if there's, if there's what, 14 balls left, it's possible there are no matches. There has to be like two, 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 or something like that, right? Or 11 balls left, whatever it is. You could put it in here saying something like, um, uh, let end game threshold equals, I don't know, 11 or so, whatever it is. And, and, and if uh, children.count is less than end game threshold, then we can start checking their normal matches. It'd go through and count how many reds, count how many blues, count how many yellows, count how many purples, whatever there are. And uh, if there were no more than two of any of them, then you've got a problem. Uh, now be careful, uh, children contains all nodes in the scene. So it'll include your um, background checkerboard. It'll include your score as well. So you want to factor that into your end game threshold. Um, so be careful of that. But something like, something like that. And you could you could add more balls if you wanted to, um, or make them match them all. One thing I'd like to do actually. One thing I'd recommend you do. This sort of sneaky little uh, Marvel post credits thing for people who waited around. Um, one thing I'd like to do is make this game harder with something like this, uh, score minus equals one in update. Uh, and it's such a simple change, but it makes the game way harder. What happens is, every time update's called now, it will subtract one from the score. Uh, so if I go ahead and share QuickTime, you'll see now I can no longer sit and plan massive moves carefully. The game will force me, oh, it's failing, I'm gonna take somewhere. Oh yeah, sorry, I've gotta come out of this one here. Come out you. The game forces you, oops, comment out, come on, comment out, there we go. The game forces you to think really quickly. You can't hang around anymore. Um, so you've got you've to sort of take what you can find. There's this trade-off between finding big, large groups and acting quickly, because every frame, you're losing a point. So at 60 frames a second, you're losing 60 points. Um, so you'll see, score now flies downwards. I might perhaps clamp it to zero, something like, uh, uh, if score is less than uh, greater than zero, sorry, then subtract one. So anyway, the, the game, the score is now flying down. So you can't sit and ponder all possible moves trying to make the massive groups of stuff. You've got to be fast and good at the same time. So um, I do that as well. Uh, let's go back to sharing my little screen. There we go. So the score is like a zero. I'll choose this big purple block there. I've earned a lot of points, but I'm losing them as the game happens. I've got to catch up, catch up, catch up. So I'm going to place one here, and then these yellow blocks here are pretty good, and this green block here is pretty nice. And again, I'm stuck playing it again. It's a bad thing. There we go. Boom. It's actually quite a fun game. I enjoy playing it. 
But anyway, when it gets stuck, you just move it around a bit, try and try and move it up a little bit, and try and rearrange them to get bigger groups. Like that. And I'll do these ones here. That's pretty good. And then over here, I'll match these greens, and then these oh, rats. Anyway, sorry. I'm going to start playing it again. It is fun, Neil. It is fun. It is fun. It's great fun. Yeah, so the performance part, you want to be careful. You want to do the least work you can. You want to check if you absolutely have to. So make sure you have uh, the condition once in there saying, am I definitely down to a certain number of balls, 15 or so, then start checking based on the number of balls you have. Uh, how do I search for articles on the website? Uh, so that what you ha what you saw there was me searching for example code articles, which is only one part of the whole site. Um, that's my example code thing here. You can just search in here for I don't know uh, table view. And it'll find you things that match table views and so forth, which is fine, um, but it's not great. And the problem is I'm running a really manky old version of Linux on the back end here, and I can't upgrade my database to have decent full text searching. Um, fast forward past the geeky bits I don't care about. I can't do site-wide search right now. I'd love to. Uh, hopefully, once I get a bit of time, which is going to be probably um, April at this rate, quite frankly, uh, I'll upgrade my Linux to uh, a newer version, get a new database version on there, and do a decent full-text search. So you can say articles, and knowledge base, and the book, and the guidebook, and the reviews, and yada, 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 all with one search right there on the homepage. That's my hope, but it's going to be about you know a month or two away because I'm just so much work right now. Question from Dennis, do I think iOS Dev and Swift will continue to grow? Oh, I think Flutter, <laughs> the Flutter question, hurrah. Um, I have no idea if Flutter will take over. I think it's safe to say that Apple are never gonna stop pushing Swift at this point. It's gonna be a, a long time yet before Apple uh, change Swift. But Swift's here to stay in that's you know our long term at the very least, so minimum 10 years, probably 20 years, um, maybe even more. So I have no qualms encouraging folks to learn Swift. I'm teaching my own uh, eight-year-old Swift every day. She loves it. She makes uh, nice playgrounds of Swift. Um, Swift's here to stay for a long time. And iOS is going away. It's not going away in the near future. They might merge it somehow into Apple OS that combines Mac OS and iOS and who knows what. Um, in the meantime, it's a safe bet. It's, it's going nowhere. Do you have to use remove OMG? Possibly, 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 possibly. Uh, wouldn't surprise me. Da, 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 da. Oh yes, so here, um, without removing it, so that's a bad thing. Um, you want to do disappear, then uh, skaction.remove from parent. Thank you very much, whoever that was. Can't see it. Oh yeah, Smongo, thank you very much. Uh, after disappearing, remove from parent, otherwise you'll clutter up with OMGs. We don't really want that, bad idea. Have I tried Apollo iOS client? No, I have not. I haven't even heard of Apollo iOS client. Sorry. Daryl, shortly, once the stream ends, in a few minutes, I will post this project, all the source code, the fragment shader, all the assets, to GitHub, to this Swift on Sundays GitHub, um, which will contain everything you need. So if you go to uh, github.com slash two straws slash uh, Swift on Sundays, you will find the source code so far. Um, that's project one through six. You will find um, seven up there imminently, maybe in about 20 minutes or so, with all the assets in there as well, so you can check them out and see what you think. Uh, Jeeper, look, so I have Hopscotch. Uh, no, I only have it because my nephew was learning Hopscotch and I wanted to learn along with him and talk to him about it. Um, that's the reason I have Hopscotch. I don't really get it. You know, I, I teach at school, my daughter's school, and I teach... Um, Coding there with a Swift and a Python together, it's great fun. Um, but they like to learn Scratch. And Scratch baffles me. I mean, the kids must think sometimes I'm a complete idiot because they can do things in Scratch that I can't even vaguely understand because it's all about dragging blocks around and you've got to know the Scratch way of doing things. And I don't know the Scratch way of doing things, so it baffles me. I want to sort of type in, do this, do this, functions, you know, da da da. And it hasn't got that. Uh, so I find Scratch baffling. Uh, and Hopscotch, I'm sure, is very similar. It's, it's it, for me. It's not just the way I'm used to coding. You know, give me C++, give me C Sharp, give me PHP, give me JavaScript, give me, give me Swift, give me whatever. I can do that. Give me draggy, droppy, blocky stuff, and I really struggle. Um, what's my opinion about Flutter? I have literally no opinion on Flutter. 
I mean, I, 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 I couldn't care less. It's yet another Google project that may or may not survive. I have genuinely no interest in Flutter at this point. Um, to use Fire Manager to create the balls array. I'm not sure why I'd want to use Fire Manager to create the balls array. I mean, like scanning through to do has prefix ball. Um, you could do that. Um, a better idea, really, I think I'm clever here to get, I think I'm getting too much detail, uh, is, go, is go into your asset catalog and add a sprite atlas. And a sprite atlas would stitch together these balls uh, into one big graphic. So it's got, you know, blue, cyan, green, gray, purple, red, yellow in one ping file. Uh, and when you do that, it's much easier to load. And the atlas will say, ball red is in the graphic at this exact rectangle, this X and Y and this width and height. Uh, and so it can load all graphics from one single, or potentially several, atlases, which is much, much faster and more efficient to do. And the best bit is, you don't care about it. You just say, here's my sprite node from image, please. Uh, give me red. And it'll say, okay, that's in a atlas. It's at this rectangle. I'll load the atlas, pull that thing out. It's way, way faster. Um, so I didn't want to do it here necessarily for this project. I'll keep it quite simple, but sprite atlases are generally a better idea for games, not uh, using file manager. Uh, question from Marcin, how do I choose the color of the explosion? Um, so in the sprite kit path collider, this thing here, you can change this color ramp. Just click on it here and choose cyan or magenta uh, and you can color it freely. And you can actually, if you want to, um, place multiple colors. So I could say, I want to start off as being cyan, then go to purple like that. So there's a lovely effect going on here and then go to, I don't know, red. So you get this lovely sort of fading out sort of multicolor effect going on. It looks really, really nice. Um, so yeah, it's great to do. In this case, I think just using white looks fine, um, but you know, do whatever works for you. I'm just gonna pull these off, otherwise it'll be confusing when I uh, put it on GitHub. There we go. Okay, it is now just gone eight o'clock here in the UK. Uh, this is your last chance to ask any questions. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter. I am at Two Straws. Join the Slack. I think I already posted the link into the chat thing. Come in there. Come and grab us. Um, when I finish this, you may be interested to know I'm going to do the 100 Days of Swift. Put that online. Um, that'll be online shortly, I guess. Uh, come and grab me. Talk to me. I'm, I'm friendly, normally, more or less. Can we use the fire color with code? Yes, you can. There is all sorts you can control in code. Um, so here's my path delimiter. If you do uh, particles dot, uh, you will see the, the, the particle color. There's so many of these things you can modify in terms of the, you know, the, changing the alpha or how much to color it by, or how much blue to add and similar. Um, there's a whole sequence of things you can do here if you want to, or just give it a general color. I want red or blue or green, whatever. Um, so that'd be a good idea just there. Uh, Andrea, do the balls rotate? So they don't. I've turned that off up here. Um, allow rotation equals false. If you look at my ball graphics, you'll see they have this sort of shine built into it. And that shine sort of simulates, you know, a light source coming in from one edge. And if they rotate, then that shine will point away from the sh light source. So it'll look really strange uh, when they rotate. So, I mean, if they were real marbles, they would actually rotate but they'd look the same because the shine's coming from the same direction. They're sort of flawless glass marbles in our example here. So that's why I've turned it off. It looks sort of um, right, I think. Uh, is the update function run 60 times a second? Yes, it is. Uh, I think I modified mine to be 120 because lol. Um, yeah, I modified mine to be 120. Note that it's preferred frame a second. It'll do it if it can, otherwise it won't do it. It'll do 60. Um, so I've asked mine to max out. And trust me, if you've got an iPad Pro, 120 hertz looks gorgeous in Sprite Kit. It looks so slick. Robert, I'm glad you're enjoying 100 Days Swift. I'm enjoying it too. I'm doing lots of new videos though, which is quite intense. It's always more work than I realized. Uh, so I'm a little bit behind uploading the videos. I apologize. I'll get to them as soon as I can. You want core data? I've done core data before in Hacking with Swift. <sighs> oh, core data. Oh. It's like the le least Swifty API. I mean, it even managed to make core animation better last year. 
to be slightly more swifty. That was really unswifty as well. Uh, coordinator is still epically unswifty. Uh, I really don't like teaching it. I left it to like project, I don't know, 38, I think it was, Hacking with Swift, because it's so bizarre in Swift. Uh, and I know it confuses folks. I don't want to put them off. So I want to say, okay, you look at all this amazing progress you've made. Now let's look at core data, right near the end of your learning, because now you've, you're feeling confident in your skills, you're feeling good about Swift and iOS. Now it's time to do some core data. So I am, I am reticent to do core data here, because it is so boring. It's so weird. We'll see. When I run out of ideas to do other streams, I might do core data, but not in the near future. It's just, I, I, I want this to be fun. You know, I want to have fun when I do these things. And Core Data is not exactly fun. Apparen, I am also waiting for day 24. And I'll do it as fast as I can. <laughs> right, that's now five past eight. This has been a super long stream. I hope you enjoyed the game. Um, and by all means, now I'm going to put it on GitHub. You can go ahead and uh, modify it, tinker with it, try it out. Break it, it's your game, ship it, add stuff to it, make it end nicely, um, add combos, I don't know. It's your game. Go ahead and modify it all you want to because I look forward to seeing what you can do with it. As far as I'm concerned though, that's it from me. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure having you all again. Thank you for all your questions. You've been a lovely audience. Um, it's been great fun. And I'll see you uh, probably next week. Uh, next week, I believe, is, is it, yeah, it'll be the first week of March. So I expect... Sean will do a live stream next week as well. I want to avoid colliding with Sean. So I want to find a time that does not click, conflict with Sean. I'm not sure that, whether that means later or earlier. I'll let you know during the week. Follow me on Twitter. Join the Slack group. I'll tell you on the Slack group what the plan is. Other than that, I will see you uh, in a week or so. Take care. Thanks for coming.